Hello and welcome. In this lecture, I'd like to discuss a notion of equivalence that is intrinsic to categories. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that every mathematical notion of sameness falls into this framework. I want to explore the question, when are two things equivalent? Personally, I think of two things as equivalent if I can construct a sort of dictionary which translates terms in one thing to terms in the other, and vice versa. Moreover, if I translate and then retranslate a term, I get the term I began with. So note that there can be many potentially different dictionaries which witness that these two things are equivalent. Therefore, two things being equivalent isn't just a passive property of these two things. It's an additional interesting piece of data. In discussing equivalence, I'm going to perform a common maneuver pioneered by Growth and Deke. Instead of saying when two objects are equivalent, I'm going to say when a relationship, i.e. a map, witnesses that two objects are the same, i.e. equivalent. In other words, I want to say when a map f from x to y is an equivalence. So f will be an equivalence if there exist two compositions of the following form. First, I want some map which, quote, undoes f. This can be formalized by saying that there exists some map g from y to x whose composition with f is the identity on x. Any notion of equivalence should be symmetric. There should be a map which is, quote, undone by f. More formally, I should have a map h from y to x so that h composed with f is the identity. Therefore, we see that we can factor the identity on y and the identity on x through f. When such a map exists, we say x is equivalent to y. There should at least be some implicit equivalence when we say this. In one of the previous lectures, I said that we can think of compositions as an algebraic operation. Here's a standard lemma which demonstrates the utility of this perspective, namely g equals h, which I'll define to be f inverse. So here's the proof. First, recall that every map factors through the identity, so that h is equal to h composed with the identity. Next, by assumption, I said that the identity factors as a composition of f and g. Next, the associativity condition allows me to move the parentheses to engulf h and f. By assumption, this composition is just the identity. Finally, by definition, the identity composed with g is just g. Therefore, h equals g, and I can victoriously declare QED. This algebraic derivation is nice if you like plugging in formal definitions. But I can also see this lemma diagrammatically. Namely, if I stretch out f, g, and h, and then compose them, note that I obtain the associativity diagram. Therefore, the coincidence of the, quote, left and right inverses, namely g and f, as well as the uniqueness of the inverse, follow from the associativity condition. I want to emphasize that this notion of equivalence varies wildly with respect to its ambient category C. So let's begin with the case when C is a poset, i.e. a category such that there exists at most one map between any pairs of objects. We think of these maps as giving a notion of less than or equal to. In this context, x is equivalent to y when x is less than or equal to y and y is less than or equal to x. In other words, whenever there's a map from x to y and a map from y to z, x is equivalent to y. Why is this the case? Well, first, the compositions of these two maps must be a map from either y to y or x to x. Note that these have to be the identity because there's only one map between an object and itself. So this map has to be the identity because I know it's there because it came from a category. Next. Note that as a plus negative a equals zero, every map in bz is an equivalence. To see this, it suffices to recall that zero is the identity map in bz, which has only one object. If c came from the real numbers, x is equivalent to y precisely when they are equal. In general, equivalence does not coincide with equal. For example, let's say I have a map between two sets a and b, which is an equivalence. I'll leave it as an exercise to show that for every b and b, we can always find a unique solution to the equation f of a equals b. In other words, an equivalence in sets is just a bijection. Finally, in matrices, there's a nice non-trivial condition for when a map is an equivalence. Namely, a matrix is an equivalence if and only if n is equal to m, i.e. it's a square matrix, 
and its determinant does not equal zero. Earlier, I said that an equivalent should be like a dictionary between two things. At this point, it's not at all clear what the terms in those things should be. In order to say what these things are, I need to digress and present a very important perspective, which makes categories infinitely more concrete, namely growth and Dijk's S-point formalism. Given two objects, S and X, we'll call a map from S to X an S-point of X. I'll usually denote this as little x sub s. These assemble into a set so that the set of s points of x is just the set of maps from s to x. When x is just a set, then an s point of x can be thought of as a labeling of s by points in x. Here, a point of s is labeled by its image under the s point x sub s. So a common phrase is to say that an s point of x is like a family of points of x parameterized by s. In some sense, you can think of s as sort of like a template or a motif. When s is a point, then a point point of x is just a point in x. When s is a line, then an s point of x can be thought of as a path in x. One way you can think of an s point of x is a sample of x of size whatever the cardinality of s is, quote, drawn with replacement. But yeah, don't get me started on how much I dislike the term sample drawn with replacement. It takes the whole like colored balls and bags way too far. So let's return to the case of a general category C and a map f from x to y. Note that a priori, this map need not be an association between things, as is the case of posets. However, we can compose f with any s point of x, which is a map, and obtain an s point in y, which we'll denote as the push forward of the s point of x along y. You should think of this as f evaluated on the s point. The following lemma states that every equivalence f gives a dictionary between s points. In other words, every equivalence f from x to y gives a bijection between the s points of x and the s points of y. As an exercise, see if you can show that the inverse of f is the inverse of the push forward of f, which recall take s points of y to s points of x, evaluated the identity of y. And now for our last example, as well as a somewhat trippy hypothesis. But first, a warning. I'm going to construct a category at a heuristic level. What I'm going to write down isn't a category in the sense I've defined, but it can be made into one through various means. So let's say we have a space X. I'm going to associate a category to X, usually referred to as the, quote, fundamental groupoid of X. An object will just be a point of X. A map will be a directed path in X, which connects two points. Composition will be a concatenation of paths. An identity on an object X is just the degenerate path which doesn't move from X. Associativity is tricky, so I won't say anything about it. It's at the level that I've constructed. It's just not associative, but don't worry about that. You can fix it really easily. If I had given a precise formulation of this category, which I haven't, I would be able to prove that every map, i.e. a path, is an equivalence. Its inverse is given by, quote, retracing your steps i.e. going along the path in the opposite direction. Here's a snapshot of two objects and two maps when x is a circle, one of which is the inverse of the path going from x to y, but passing through the south pole. As I can always retrace my steps, every map in this category is an equivalence. And now for the cryptic aphorism, namely Groth and Dijk's homotopy hypothesis, which states that a category with only equivalences which are commonly referred to as groupoids, is the fundamental groupoid of some space. That's hardly a precise mathematical statement, but it's been made into one. One should think that many aspects of this theory were constructed in order for this statement to be true. Again, don't take what I'm saying too seriously. I'm going to be like irresponsibly back of the envelope. For example, BZ is a groupoid and therefore should correspond to some space. Hopefully, the picture I've drawn suggests that this space is just a circle. 
The unique object corresponds to the point one in the circle, which for convenience, I'm thinking of as being the unit complex numbers. This correspondence takes a number A, which recall is a map in BZ, to the path which loops around the circle A times. More formally, it can be written as E to the minus two pi I theta over A. In terms of the diagram in the center, the composition of these two maps represents minus one as it's going clockwise. Finally, note that every category has a groupoid sitting inside of it, obtained by discarding all the maps that are not equivalences. In other words, one can imagine that a space naturally sits inside of a category, which some refer to as the, quote, moduli space of objects of C. And that's all I have for today. Hope you enjoyed this lecture. Talk to you later.